Well, first, Holmes was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. What's up, Holmes? Beware your host, Jonathan Holmes. <laughs> oh, what a day we're having. Sinistar, me, Rich, technical problems all around. But thank you for joining us on the show. Hopefully we look okay. It's very hot where I am, so I'm shinier than usual. Rich, you look dry and clean as a whistle. I am. I'm very how clean, you, very dry. How do, you, <laughs> how do you stay? Is it not hot where you are, or do you have air conditioning? It's it's not hot here. I'm uh I'm in Berkeley. It's it's raining, but I'm inside, so I'm dry as a whistle. I <laughs> uh, thank you for coining that term with me. Uh, you make music, and you also I've read anyway have uh, dabbled in game development yourself here and there. Is that correct? Just a little bit here and there. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, when did you get started in the whole music making thing? Music making. Uh, well, I grew up in a musical family, but I sort of uh, I, I took a long time to get into it. I didn't really start playing music until I was in high school. Um, Did you start with the guitar or the keyboard? Yeah, I started with guitar, and uh, I've been playing that for a while, and then got into keyboard, and yeah, that's... Ah, and uh, you started making music for video games pretty early on. How the hell did you pull that off? That's a dream job for many a person, <laughs> and you got right into it. Is that, uh, is that right? Yeah, I started doing it, when, uh, I think, when I was about 20, um, and it was very random. Uh, I was I was a member on some forum that was totally unrelated to games or music, but I would post my music there um, that I had been writing for a couple of years. And it was mostly like it was mostly like uh, drop D guitar, like new metal jams and stuff. <laughs> I would have never guessed that, really. And you yeah. played all the music on it. You dropped the D, and did you sing on it too? D. Yeah, no, no singing, no singing. No. But uh, so, so there was a guy on the forum who uh, was like a he was a CEO of a software developer, um, and they were doing some some cell phone apps, and uh, they were like, "Hey, I like your music. Do you want to do some music for me?" So I did. I did. I did a bunch of uh, like MIDI files because the cell phones back then, you know, they didn't have any audio playback. Um, so I did a bunch of MIDI files. And then I'm pretty sure that um, all the projects I worked on for that guy either got canceled or they got released, but they didn't put the music in. They, they forgot or I don't know what happened, but it was kind of, an, it was kind of a disaster. <laughs> and where you, did you go by disaster piece at that time or is that something that evolved a little bit later? It would be, it would be funny if I could tell you that you know, as a result of that disastrous project, I came up with the name, but uh, I think I came up with it before that. Um, and it was just... It's just a play on masterpiece, and uh, I had never thought of that. I well, this there whole you time go. I was <laughs> my uh, I took it as like this guy knows that there's disasters in our world, but he wants peace. He wants peace for everyone. Well, that's why I changed. That's why I changed the spelling because masterpiece is P I E C E, right? And I changed it to peace because I was like, oh, it's like disaster, peace, peace. One of these is one of these is bad. One of these is like up your ass, and the other one is peace. I can't remember which one, but I think this is up your ass. Okay, yeah, so that's what the Italians tell me, and this is John Lennon. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and you're playing. You're you're doing this kind of music, and you're selling it separate from the games, and you've made a name for yourself separate from games, and and have a following, which is great to see. Uh, in a genre of music that I'm not. I'm not aware if this kind of music was really around 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I love music. I've been paying attention to music and pop culture uh, fluctuations mm. and changes and cycles for a long time. And I've been waiting for like a new kind of music to show up because mm. like even emo was just kind of like just kind of rock and roll with uh, guys who had feelings, and that's been around for a while. Like I and dubstep, it's it's you know blah, 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 is something. Yeah. That is a thing, but it's not. It doesn't feel like a whole new genre to me. But what you do feels like a new genre to me, and I feel like people are catching on to it. Um, but uh, that's just my my take. Do you feel like you're a part of a new genre of music? What you're doing? Are you Are you talking about my style, or are you talking about yeah. chip tunes? You're talking about my style. I'm talking about uh, your style as it's. To me, it's beyond chiptunes a little bit, but uh, yeah. you would definitely be the expert on that. Uh, tell us about how you define your style, where you think it fits in, and do you think it's part of a new uh, budding genre? 
no, I I like to think I'm not so uh, so full of myself that I <laughs> that I feel like I created an entirely new genre of music. Um, it's just a uh, you know it's just a blend of my my influence and my tastes. Um, uh, you know, film music, classical music, progressive rock, metal, electronic music, jazz. It's you know I just I pull you know I pull from everything. So um, maybe that's why you feel like it's a new style. Yeah, it it, it doesn't. <laughs> it's it's it's. I can't think of anybody who it sounds like you thought. Oh, they play like that. I'm going to play a little bit like they do. Like how the the Misfits were just kind of like the Ramones with a little bit more grumpiness. Uh, you aren't really like anyone else with added anything, in my opinion. It it all depends on the project, I suppose. But mm. uh, you mentioned chip tunes before. Were chip uh, tunes influential to you at all, or did it just fit uh, the the work you were doing on the on the games in terms of technical limitations and whatnot? Yeah, it was influential because of the technical limitations, and uh, it, it was an aesthetic that I grew up with. So I was always, you know, I always liked it. Um, mm. I brought it up because I thought maybe you were, were talking about the chip tune genre, which mm. I don't really think is a genre at all because chip tunes are so. So I mean, I guess you could. You could talk about like chip tunes that are in this very like video gamey style, but there are a lot of people who do chip tunes that are totally, they're totally unrelated almost to games. People doing like you know dance tracks and people doing, I mean like doing jazz and all kinds of crazy stuff. So, um, but yeah, I did chip tunes for a long time. I still and I still do chip tunes. Um, I mean, I try to get away from it and I try to, I try to explore new new avenues. But it's it's just it's like. Uh, I don't know. It's like my my uh, my old love or something. I keep coming mm. back to it and stealing little ideas and uh, you know finding finding ways to incorporate some of those ideas into my music. It's interesting that it's become a genre in people's minds. Whereas to me, chip tune is just like how a, a distorted electric guitar can be used for many different genres of music. It's a, yeah. it's an instrument as opposed to a right. whole genre, but people have lumped them together and consider themselves fans specifically just of chiptunes, be it, uh, you know, Anamata Gucci or, or your yeah. work. Uh, they, you've been kind of clumped together. Do you feel good about being kind of in the same league, if you will, as uh, people like Anamata Gucci? Sure. I mean, I don't really care that much about grouping mm. so much. I mean, I think I think largely it's just a you know it's just a way that people find music, um, and I want people to find my music, so you know they can call it whatever they want. <laughs> <As long laughs> and do you play? It, do you like play it. live? Do you tour? Um, I I did a I did a Mexican tour last year, and that is the only tour I've ever done. <laughs> what what brought upon the Mexican tour? It was an email. I just got an email from some guys in Mexico who were on a uh, like a video game music concert, uh, and I I played two shows. I played with uh, Yamoka-san, Akira Yamoka, who did the Silent Hill soundtracks, and uh, Bayon, who uh, who does music for Pixel Junk, and the One Ups, who are like a video game cover band. Oh sure, our editor in chief was once a member of the One Ups, Dale North. Well, there you go. He played saxophone for them. Cool. That's amazing. So, what? How was the Mexican tour? Please tell us. It was. Oh, it was such a great trip. It was. It was amazing. Uh, it was. It was kind of my first. Well, it was my first trip to Mexico. Uh, my first trip outside of probably the states and Canada. Um, people were super nice. Food is fantastic. Uh, they love. They're really, really into video game music there. The concerts were huge. They were like, they were the largest concerts I've ever played. They were both, they were both over a thousand people, um, and uh, you know they were lining up, they were lining up around the door just to like, uh, just to like meet with artists before the show for like an hour, and they were they were charging like crazy amounts of money just to, just to have them like talk to us and, you know, sign uh, have have us sign their stuff. So it was pretty crazy. It was a pretty crazy experience. I, f I felt uh, I felt like I didn't belong there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was gonna say it's a uh, that's so great. I'm so glad you got to do that. But how do you feel like you got to this place where I mean I I, I can't be sure. Maybe when you go to Starbucks, people are asking you for the, your autograph right off the bat. But you in a in a certain circle, you are. <laughs> 
a big deal, and, and deservedly so in my opinion, but it's rare for people who make video games at all to get calls to tour in Mexico, and uh, even rarer <laughs> for people who just do the music to gain that kind of uh, recognition. So uh, do you have an idea as to, because I'm sure a lot of people watching the show also make music and are hoping to get to where you are. Do you have any words of advice or any idea of how you've, you've managed to do it? I think, I mean, I think part of it is definitely luck, uh, and I'm definitely grateful to be where I am. Um, but I think another part of it is is kind of going, just kind of going out on my own, and uh, just being being one guy, you know, mm -hmm. with with a uh, brand, so to speak, or an identity that you know can kind of be, I don't know, recognizable or or memorable, and uh, making myself, you know, publicly available or around, and uh, putting all my music online, um, just kind of being open facing. I think mm -hmm. that's been mm -hmm. the most important thing for me. So, And the brand part of it is interesting to me. Was that something that you consciously thought, I'm going to express my ideas about what I do and try to make it easy for people to understand what it is through an alias and through art direction and, and through things that kind of quickly deliver the message of what you are on the Internet? Was that something you put some time and effort into or did it just kind of come together? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely. I definitely thought about you know kind of grouping all my work into a single entity and a single place so that it was easier for people. In the past, I when I first started uh, writing music for games, I was just using my name because I had been I had been doing stuff as Disaster Piece before uh, before I started working in games, and mm -hmm. I thought, oh, it's going to be different. It's going to be you know I'm going to be doing like all kinds of styles of music, which I which I've been trying to do. Um, and I, I looked at it as a different thing because it wasn't like, it wasn't like proggy chip tunes like my old stuff was. But at mm -hmm. some point I was like, you know, this is, there's no point in separating these. I might as well just put it all together and make it easier. Um, yeah, but it's something that I've been, I've been, you know, uh, honing and changing and modifying for the last couple of years, you know, changing logos and all that stuff, trying to simplify it and make it cooler. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and I do see similarities. You, to, to me, it's like you, Danny B. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. I'm suddenly blanking on his name. The fellow who did the music for Sword and Sorcery is getting really Jim big. Guthrie. Jim Guthrie. He's not video game music though. But people who like video games have kind of grabbed him and clutched onto him and said, yeah, now, now you are a video game music guy. We, uh, he'd, been, he'd opened up for all sorts of people in, uh, yeah. in Canada. He was kind of a big deal in certain circles for a while, and now he's kind of found this new life. So do you, do you think of the genre you've been put in as video game music? Does that genre make any sense? I mean, what is video game music exactly? It does, I mean... It makes as much sense as I guess film music makes. Um, there's you know there there's a commonality in the in the form in that it's you know it's for a certain purpose. But I mean it 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 uh, includes all genres and all styles of music. So it's like a different it's like a different thing. It's not really technically a genre. I don't think. But mm -hmm. um, I think Jim is a really good example because he's you know I mean is he is that video game music? I don't know. I mean it's He's uh, he's he's a great talent, and he's he's had a lot of success in Canada. I think he's I think he's won Juno awards and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like he's he's been able to get into games and and use that to sort of you know make his you know uh, increase his his fan base and get his music out to more people while still sort of being his own thing. You know he's doing he's doing his own thing, and uh, someone who didn't know that he worked on a game would listen to his music and they would they wouldn't think it was video game music, I don't mm -hmm. think. So. Yeah. It, it seems to me that it's kind of, there's an audience of people who have formed this identity around video game culture, and they want a soundtrack for their culture. And they're picking and choosing different people to be a part of that soundtrack. And whether mm -hmm. you, know, you chose to or not, you are kind of a part of the way they think about music and the way they categorize music. And it's all sorts of people. I was at an Anime Gucci uh, concert 
couple weeks ago, and I didn't even really know their music that well. I just went for the, the heck of it, and I saw like 50-year-old ladies pumping their fists to it, and like <laughs> jumping up and down and freaking out. It's just, uh, it's music that in a way is faceless, so you don't have to associate it with like, like they wouldn't go to a rap concert because they don't want to think of themselves as in the same bracket as uh, Ice Cube or Ice T. And they don't want to go to uh, a Justin Bieber concert because they don't want to like feel like they're trying to look younger than they are. But Anna Monaguchi, nobody knows what that is. It's just video games, I guess. So they just go and, and have a great time. And of course, there were a lot of people there who clearly were like, the video game culture is a big part of them. They're wearing a Zelda hat and a Mario shirt and like uh, Assassin's Creed gloves and whatnot. But but it seems like a genre. It seems like a genre that a lot of people can attach themselves to, which which must be nice. Do you find that your fan base is pretty broad in who uh, is part of that demographic, or is it pretty particular who your fans uh, end up being? I mean, I think I think most of my fans are you know fans of games. A lot of them are, um, and uh, you know it's not the kind of thing that even if you wanted to, which I don't, that you could distance yourself from or try to change I mean it's bigger than you it's bigger than you know you and your music it's you know it's yeah it's bigger than that um, sure and do you find that fans of games is it uh, the kind of the stereotype which is a lot of guys in their teens uh, up to late 30s or is it broader than that um, it's definitely yeah I mean that's definitely like probably the majority um, mm -hmm. but that's not that's not to say everybody but mm -hmm. um, in my dealings that, you know, a, a lot of the people that I deal with or talk to, like a lot of the fans I talk to are, um, you know, fit that demographic or are game, or are game developers or mm -hmm. artists of some kind, which is really awesome. I, I, really, I really like getting messages from artists. It's really cool when you get a message from, like, an animator or, like, a, you know, a concept artist or someone who's like, I listen to your music, and it really helps me. It really helps me like to work through my problems when I'm when I'm working and like uh, you know here's this thing I made while I was listening to music. That's like oh. my favorite. Listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It it sounds like in you they see someone that they they believe is genuinely doing something similar to what they're doing. And I don't think anyone gets into video game music or or any kind of uh, alternate type of music, uh, alternate than pop music or established genres that are. Money makers. Uh, in short, people don't do what you do because they think I'm going to get rich. Uh, or, or did you? Did you sit down one day and thought, "Oh, the guy who did the theme song to Mega Man 2, that guy must be loaded. I'm going no. for it." No. <laughs> no, never, never. I was, you know, I was like, I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, you know, and I, I was foolish enough to to go to music school. Um, I mean, in, in hindsight, it's probably it was probably a good good thing, um, but it was sort of you know a risk that I that I took to go to music school, um, and you know when I went, I had no notion of video game music even being a thing. I don't think, um, or just v very vaguely, like I, I had already been doing chip tunes, but I wasn't even thinking about you know working on games. I was that was so far fetched to me. I didn't realize I could even do that. Um, mm. I saw myself like oh, I'll probably end up working in a recording studio, you know, or something. And along the way, you know, I, I tried to, I was going to, to, to music school and I thought that that was my path, that I was going to, you know, work in studios and stuff. And when I, when I, when I wrote out my, uh, my application, my entry application for the, the music production, like the recording and engineering major at my school, they basically told me, you know, based on based on what you do and you know based on your letter it seems like you're not like this is not the right path for you like it seems like there's there's another path for you so I actually got I actually got turned down and uh, then I applied for uh, synthesis which is like uh, music production and like you know using synthesizers and professional knob turning so to speak and uh, I got accepted to that I guess I was I guess that was more along the lines of what I wanted so, I'm and glad that worked way, out. Yeah. It worked out good. It worked out good. <laughs> along the way, I, you know, I there was a club, a club at my school called the Video Game Music Club, and it was just, you know, it was other students who were interested in games and music, and you know, kind of pooling our resources together to find out about, um, you know, like local events, um, internships, stuff like that, 
Um, and that's kind of that was kind of the beginning of of me getting into uh, working on games. Ah, interesting. Did you have any influences in video games, or I'd want to hear about your influences um, all over mm-hmm. the place, of course. But specifically, were there any games that you played or heard at you know, growing up that you thought I want to do something similar to that? You know, I think I think the influences hit me uh, in hindsight. Like I didn't thinking about it when I was younger, but uh, I definitely remembered stuff. You know, when I when I started getting into it, um, uh, the the Chrono the Chrono games mm. definitely were like a big influence for me. Uh, Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger, like oh, those are my favorite. Those are two of my favorite soundtracks. Um, and just you know, just just games that I happened to have as a kid. Um, you know. Uh, like Marble Madness or Tetris, yeah. you know, anything by Kojima, like like Mario, Mario games, pretty much all that stuff, you know, is just so ingrained in my brain from, uh, you know, because the when you play games, you know, ba- especially back then, there was not that much music in them. So, you know, you're hearing this music over and over and over and over again. So mm-hmm. by the time you're older, you've heard this song like, you know, 9,000 times <laughs> or whatever. Not, and it like, has to be designed yeah. for that. Like for, for me... Um, I always think of the Mega Man series when I think about what is a game that needs its music or else you can't really enjoy it. And and I die so often, or at least when I was growing up, I died so often in the Mega Man games. If that music wasn't fun to hear over and over and over again, um, I would have been miserable. But uh, it almost makes death kind of a reward that you die. <laughs> and, stops, and then you're like, oh, you get to hear that cool song again. And then it starts up again. And you're like, oh, I can do this. And it kind of pushes you forward. Um, but uh, that's my take on uh, video game music anyway. What do you think are some of the essential roles in the games you've worked on? Like when you worked on, oh, I don't know, Fez, for instance. Well, what did you think? Well, I need to add this to this game to help with other aspects of the design so it all kind of fits cohesively. Um, how did you go about taking that on? That's a good question. Um, I definitely, you know, I think the, the first thing that, that you tackle is you, you, wanna, uh, you, you want to you wanna evoke some kind of emotion with the player and you want to you wanna up the, the cohesion level of, of uh, the areas where you're putting music. So we, based on the game, we decided to do location-based music. Um, so a lot of the themes are based on you know locations, but there are also there there's also music in the game that's contextual. It's based on you know it's based on um, uh, whether you've been here before or not, or you know what time of day is it, um, things like that. Um, and so there's that, but then there there are also some like there's some systems in place where like uh, as you get higher or as you progress through an area, you know the music sort of changes to to uh, react to, the, to that and kind of give the player additional feedback. Um, so we had a lot of time and we had some cool tools and we kind of we tried to we tried to experiment and do a lot of different things and to give the player as much feedback um, as we could with the music. That- yeah, absolutely. Was that did that feel like a a challenge or a risk? It sounds like it sounds relatively innovative to me. I mean, it happens to some degree in like Resident Evil. Suddenly, the music will boom when a, a zombie shows up. But to have it be more subtle and for Fez, uh, I felt the music was just the right balance of um, it grabs your attention and you feel it when there's a lull in what's going on on screen. But then once you get into the the more difficult parts of the platforming, it, it doesn't like bombard you with stimuli. It kind of backs off enough that you can focus on just the visuals, and then when there's another kind of um, uh, motion-inducing, just kind of being there moment, uh, you can focus on the music again. Was that something that felt, I don't know, was it scary to take that on? It, it seemed to me that it was taking some risks, what you were doing. Um, well, there, it definitely wasn't anything revolutionary, um, but uh, we were um, we had this. It's basically a huge canvas. I mean, when I when I joined the project, it was just a big game, a big ass game with no music in it. Mm. So it was like you know, go crazy, do whatever you want. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we had we had this really amazing tool that um, that Renaud Bedar, the programmer for Fez, created, which let us do all this crazy stuff with loops and timing stuff and fading things in and out and. Uh, time of day and all this stuff and we kind of you know we used that a lot and we we worked on that tool to make it even better so we could do even more crazy stuff um, and uh, but what you were so- talking about with like um, 
you know, how the music kind of comes in in certain places and kind of pulls back in others. That was, that was a conscious decision um, where I, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, make sure the music redeemed as much of its value or like retained as much of its value as it, as it could by not overwhelming the player with mm. like, with like sensory material all the time. So there are, there are, um, there are a lot of levels in Fez where there's no music or the music is in the process of sort of dying, dying away. Um, and you know, there'll just be ambience and things like that. And that was just one of the ways that we tried to, um, I guess, make the, make the music more, a more immersive, like a more of an immersive experience for the player. Absolutely. But, uh, it doesn't sound like you felt like you were taking a risk in doing that. Whereas a lot of uh, game composers I've talked to, they say when they uh, when they're working with a client, the clients like you have to make this catchy all the time, beats, 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 make them happy all the time. And they're like, I don't get to take any risks. I'm just like doing. Uh, they they tell me anyway that it feels yeah. like they're following a blueprint that there's no deviation from, and they get treated kind of like how the programmers get treated, just like you know, put the zeros and ones where I want them in this game and don't uh, do anything that might uh, rock the boat in any way. Uh, it doesn't sound like that's how it was on Fez, which is fantastic, but have you ever gone through an experience like that where a client was just like, make this thing with the beats and <laughs> don't be interesting? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think over time as, as I've worked on more projects and people are more familiar with my music, I've been fortunate enough where... I guess there's more trust between me and the developers, and uh, mm -hmm. they they respect my vision or, or whatever, and they, they they want me to sort of go out and kind of experiment and do what I think is best. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, obviously, sometimes you work on a project where someone has a very they're very, they have a very uh, precise vision about everything, and they they kind of want to put their stamp on it. Um, and especially early on, when I first started working on games, you know, I would. I would come into projects where there was a very, there were very rigid guidelines about what we were doing, or I was, you know, I was working under another composer, um, mm. and I had so I had to match his style. Um, so I mean, even even on projects where you have some freedom, there's always there's always restraints and there's always limitations. Um, you know, sometimes they're imposed by other people, but you know, a lot of times, you know, as a composer, you have to impose them on yourself to some. To some extent, um, I think it's just part of the you know it's just part of writing music for, um, you know writing music for games uh, or for media. You know you not not all the time, but in a lot of games, you know you want to you want to strive for like a consistent aesthetic. So a part of it is like figuring out what that is and then kind of adhering to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then consistency comes from there being guidelines and some barriers that you're not going to let yourself cross in order to make the style cohesive and, and uh, uniform. That makes sense. Um, where do you think composers kind of stand in the video game industry as of now? Because I'm sure you know other people who write music for games, and I'm sure you talk about professionally what the experience is like. Uh, where do you think the, the position of the composer is in terms of where people, uh, where video game publishers and developers, uh, where do they prioritize you guys at this point? Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think it's a consistent, I don't think there's a consistent answer to that question. I think, you know, I think every project is different and I think some games, in some games music is a lot more important than other games. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, just because even though I'm a composer, I um, you know I don't always think music is the best solution to every problem. Um, mm. <laughs> um, but but uh, you know I think I think in independent games, um, it's you know it's uh, there's there's a we're in a good position right now because you know when you're working on a small team, um, you know a lot of times you know uh, composers are brought in you know, to handle an entire discipline by themselves, which is, by itself is, is nice. Mm -hmm. um, just in terms of the, you know, your level of commitment to the project and, um, you know, getting, you, you know, generally you get a nice piece of the pie. Um, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. That's good to hear. I don't think that yeah. was always, I mean, talking to friends of mine, I'm friends with the guy who did the music for Shogi and 
uh, gratu gratuitous space battles and a few games, but he's not quite broken out in terms of becoming a name, and he doesn't get much of the pie from what I gather. Mm. And he's kind of he's oftentimes treated like. Uh, you know, we could take you or leave you. You just kind of have to do what we want and uh, make us see. He gets a lot of, like, make it funner. And he's like, what does that mean? And yeah. <laughs> he'll just try to, like, write different music. They're like, no, more fun. And he just is kind of lost with notes that don't really tell him where to go. Um, interesting, though, that you would say that uh, some sometimes music isn't the way to solve the problem. Can you think of a, a game where you thought the music... Oh, that would be mean, I guess. You yeah. don't want to tell the composer, but I'm really <laughs> curious. Because uh, to me, music, if a game doesn't have good music, um, or if the music doesn't fit well or solve some of the problem for me, I often tune out. Like, I, I don't play a lot of open world games because the they don't have much music, and I just kind of feel a, a deadness there. Um, whereas Animal Crossing, Jesus, yeah. I can't put the thing down, and part of it's because the music is um, it's not too intrusive, but it's just mm. right for me. Uh, hmm. But I guess you don't want to answer that because it would be me. Well, I could talk about it. I mean, I feel like I think some of the games you mentioned are great examples of music being used really well, mm. but I, I think there are a lot of games where there's there's either too not enough music played too frequently, mm -hmm. uh, or yeah, a lot of times the music is just played too frequently, and that that tends to be one of the biggest problems. I think. Um, where you know it creates fatigue, ear fatigue with with players, and they just it's it's grating. It can be it can become grating. Um, mm. I think um, you know a game that that's uh, came out recently that doesn't have a lot of music in it, but I think is really well done is Kentucky Route Zero. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, those games there's there's very little music in them, but uh, the music is 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 placed you know in very appropriate and like particular ways. To you know, uh, underline like special, like important moments. Um, I think that's. I think in general that idea of you know letting the music kind of fade away or die out, and you know let the player focus on something else for a little while. I think that. I think that adds value to music. Because, you know, if it's not around as often, you you're more likely to appreciate it when it's there. Um, and also, you know, there there are movies. I mean, like the movie uh, and No Country for Old Men um, mm -hmm. and other movies that don't have any soundtracks. Um, you know, I think those are, those are proof of the, the impact that, you know, not having any music can actually, it can create a certain tone um, that can be very effective. Um, so I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for sort of experimentation and innovation just in, 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 in how to, you know, how to approach music and how much to use and things like that. Yeah, it sounds like you don't want to stick to one hard and fast idea of what music always has to be in a given project, that it's um, being humble. I mean, what I'm taking more and more from this is that you don't want the music to kind of be the, I don't know if you follow basketball, I sure don't, but I know some <laughs> basketball players are just always trying to grab the ball and always trying to shoot and the, the team ends up losing uh, because of that, because one person is making it about them as opposed to the the team as a cohesive whole. So, uh, mm -hmm. have you always had that attitude, or did when you first came into it, when you were younger, did you think like I'm just gonna steal the show with this music, and people are gonna focus on on that, and when they play the game, they're gonna think about me more than than anything else? I think I think probably um, just being in games for a little while now and uh, feeling feeling more comfortable with with myself and. Uh, feeling like I'm in a good spot, uh, you know, and fortunate to be in that place. I'm less, uh, you know, I, I have the, the uh, I'm fortunate enough that I can be, I don't have to be, uh, you know, always desperate to sort of get, you know, get my uh, voice out, mm -hmm. um, even in places where maybe, it, uh, you know, it's not the best place for it to be. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I can certainly, I, you know, I certainly relate to, uh, you know, a lot of other people who are, uh, starting or who are struggling to get work because that's sort of the name of the game. Uh, it seems like there's some kind of plateau, you know, or not plateau, but you sort of, you, you know, it can be hard to kind of get over this hump where, you know, you, people start to know who you are and, and you can, you can find work more easily. Before that, mm -hmm. it can be really difficult just to, just to string together like one or two projects. Um, and when I started, it was really hard for me and I, you know, I had a, I had to work a part-time job and sort of, um, 
pay my dues, I guess. Sure, but, um, absolutely. I'm glad those days are over. Does that give you the feeling that you can focus more on music and take more risks with doing stuff that might not be involved in games? Because a, uh, a lot of people who are fans of your work have told me, I don't even really care about his game music that much. It's his solo <laughs> projects that they love the most. Um, mm. So does that give you more room to breathe when it comes to those sorts of things? Yeah, I think I think my my um, my goals and my like my direction is sort of changing now, um, mm -hmm. because I'm fortunate enough to have a little bit of a following. I feel like I can I have I can try different stuff and uh, work work in different mediums. Um, like I'm doing some you know I'm working on some cartoon stuff right now, and uh, I'm doing I'm doing sound effects work for some some app some software developers like for apps and stuff. And, uh, you know, I really want to make an album, just a regular, a plain old album would be nice because I haven't done that in, year, in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to have that freedom to do that uh, is, is definitely, it, it's, it's enabling. It's in a good way. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, how many projects are you working on right now, if you had to count? Um, you know, I always I always try to keep it down, but I think I'm I think I'm at like a dozen right now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of I tried to research you a bit. I did make the effort. Yeah. Um, I knew about <laughs> Monsters Ate My Birthday Cake. That's how I actually got in contact with you was through those guys. They they seem very nice. And I know you're working on Fez Two, uh, mm -hmm. which was newly announced. Uh, what else are you doing? Uh, I'm working on uh, this game called Cannon Brawl. Uh, which is a it's a kind of a Worms meets RTS and uh, it's it got greenlit so it'll be on Steam. Uh, so I'm working on that. I'm doing orchestral like brass heavy orchestral music for that. And uh, what else? I'm working on this game called The Floor Is Jelly, which has been quietly in development for the last like two or three years. It was uh, it was an IGF student uh, finalist a couple years ago. Wow. And uh, like five other games, or four, three or four other. Oh, I'm working on Gun House with uh, Brandon Sheffield. Uh, that's pretty. I'm pretty stoked for that. And uh, yeah, I, I played that at E3 briefly. I was yeah. really impressed. Uh, I couldn't hear it though, sadly. Yeah. And he did. He did <laughs> mention your name. It's hard for me to uh, re recall and retain all of the stuff you're working on right now. That's a really interesting game. It's running on the Vita and yeah. phone. Is that right? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a puzzle fighter with some tower defense elements with just shooting guys yeah. and protecting orphans. Wasn't it based on a Molodew uh, tweet? It, it, it probably... I, that sounds familiar. Maybe it was. It's yeah. a pretty unusual idea, uh, but mm. it's it, it works pretty well, I think. It's yeah, pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking like, forward uh, to playing some more of it. Yeah. So. Uh, and what are some of the other ones? I want to know about the floor is jelly. What the heck is that? The Floor is Jelly uh, is, it pains me to use this phrase, but it's a puzzle platformer, uh, and, uh, but it's, it's cool. It's, uh, the floors are gelatinous, um, so it affects the way you move around the world, um, and there are different areas that have different sort of gimmicks, so to speak, uh, that affect the way you play, uh, and uh, it's, it's a cool game. It's cool. It's, uh, it's sort of a kind of meditative, but also kind of, you know, kind of trigger trigger happy uh, mm. because it's, uh, you know, it's a platformer and, it, you know, you have to kind of rely on your reflexes, not not unlike, you know, Super Meat Boy or something. Sure. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Huh. What's that going to come out on? I have no idea. Uh, I think I think it'll be a PC game. Sure. That's I usually think. where they start. Huh. That sounds great. And what are any other projects you can name or are they secret? <laughs> what else am I working on? Uh, I'm working on a, a iOS game called Robots Love Ice Cream. <laughs> I heard about that too. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on that. What is what is that? Um, it's I don't I don't know how to explain it. You drive a truck and you has and you uh, you shoot you shoot ice cream at robots. <laughs> Uh, and these guys were mostly just coming after you, it sounds like, which is great. Uh, was that do you do you thank Fez for a lot of that? Do you think Fez was the game that that caused you to reach this point where you are a sought after commodity, or had it been going on before that? 
Um, I had gotten a couple breaks before that, but that was definitely that was definitely that's definitely sort of like the turning point for me. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Since that, you know, I guess uh, I mean the just the soundtrack sales of that game that game. Uh, you know, they they uh, they out they outdid all of my other albums combined uh, many times over. So that was definitely the the most uh, public thing that I've ever done. So. Um, since then, I've been fortunate enough that uh, I've been been getting offered a lot of opportunities. Um, so I I haven't even really had a chance to to look for you know projects to work on. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice though. Maybe I should maybe I should be be more be more of a jerk and say no to everybody, <laughs> so I can so I can pick and choose more. <laughs> oh, you've got a lot of time. You can be a jerk when you're soured and in your fifties and say, "No, nah, Fez wasn't even that good. It was over." Yeah, right my I'm my old stuff. And cynical. <laughs> yeah, it happens to everybody. Everyone <laughs> I've met anyway, sadly. Um, what do you think it was about Fez that caused it to break out the way it did, and also the music? What do you think it caused? What was different about the music for Fez that caused it to be such a an attention grabbing? Um, resonant thing where people like directly thanked you for part of why that game was so successful. Um, I think, I think just the development period, the fact that the game was in development for like five years, mm -hmm. um, hype. Um, so, but it came out like if you were following games at all, you probably knew about Fez. So that mm -hmm. definitely helped a lot. Um, also the game, the game is pretty cool. I think, I think it's a pretty good game. Uh, it looks great. And, um, and then getting to the music, um, uh, I so the hmm, it was definitely a new direction for me. I mean, it's it's uh, it's more accessible probably than than my standard music, my standard fare, which is more. It's very generally very progressive, like progressive rock influenced. Lots of lots of time changes of all kinds and stuff like that. And uh, the Fez music is is simpler. Uh, kind of minimalistic, um, but also I think I tried I tried really hard to kind of do do a chip tune style thing, but make it contemporary. Mm. Um, and I think people got that, which is awesome. Um, and there's a lot of there's a lot of melodies and stuff. I think I think uh, I think I I had been saving up some of my material that I had just come up with over the years, and I used a lot of the catchiest stuff that I'd ever written for for Fez. I think. Um, so maybe that helped. <laughs> sure, it makes a lot of sense. So the the time it took to make, which was torture for for Phil Fish and uh, the other guys working on it, from what I'm told, was actually really helpful for you to kind of use the best of those years to to make a soundtrack. Um, that's very interesting. But how about? I'm very interested to hear about how your relationship with the audience, whether you feel that on Fez anyway if you were kind of there more to just give the audience what they might have wanted or whether you were thinking well this is also about me doing something and you guys can kind of take it or leave it because uh, the time signatures and progressive rock in general to me that's a genre where a lot of the guys I know working in it are like we're never going to be big and that's okay we're not in it to give the audience what they want already we're in it to push the boundaries of what we can do and if we're excited and we're interested in what we're doing Maybe people will catch on to that and will gain enough of a following to continue. But with Fez, it uh, sold out definitely isn't the right term. But uh, you know, going for a more mainstream appeal sounds like it's something that you might have uh, done on that. So was that a conscious decision? And do you find yourself having that relationship with your work and your audience where you're thinking, well, this part is more for you, this part was more because I wanted to do it, and, and balancing that? Um, hmm. It's definitely it was definitely conscious to sort of focus more on present on creating a cinematic experience um, and generally you know cin cinematic music doesn't have crazy t you know tempo changes and uh, all that kind of stuff um, mm. but there I mean I I didn't completely abandon that style I don't think I mean there are definitely a lot of sort of the things that I like to do that are that come through in music. Um, so I think for me it was more I was just I was just focusing on a different part of my music and also trying trying new things experimenting which for me is one of the it's one of like my guiding principles just for working is um with all my projects I really try to do something new I try to push my boundaries um 
I give myself a hard time, stress myself out and stuff. Uh, <laughs> But it's uh, it's working. I'm glad that I hope it doesn't stress you out to the point where you don't enjoy it at some point and stop. But uh, that yeah, never it comes across in your work definitely that you're not satisfied to just kind of sit on your laurels and do what you've already done. So so where would you say you balance the inspiration of just I just want to do this thing and before you know it you're writing a bunch of notes that just came to you and the side of it that's like problem solving like. I want to make the audience feel this and that, and how am I going to use the tools at my disposal to send the audience where I think they should go? Um, how do you balance that with just the urge to make stuff without having any idea of how it's going to affect people? I, I um, you know, there's a process that I go through where, um, you know, like with Fez, for instance, there are there are a number of pieces of music in Fez that were um, taken from old ideas that I hadn't finished. Um, so I went through a process of listening to all of my ideas. I have, I have um, on my computer. I have like, I have like maybe a thousand just loose musical ideas that I haven't used. So I'm always like picking from that. Um, and I kind of just have this. I go through this listening process where I'm just listening. Um, I'm thinking about a particular, a particular location or a particular solution that I need to solve, and I'm just listening to pieces of music. And I'm just thinking, how would this work for this? Would this, would this fit? And it's kind of just an intuitive process where if I hear the right thing, I just know it. And I'm like, this is perfect for this. Like, I know this will work. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And the other thing I do is I will just write music in the style of the game. Um, and then I'll think, and then I'll play the game a whole bunch. And I'll just think about, you know, maybe this, where could this work? Could this work somewhere? Um, and if it's a big enough, like Fez is pretty big, I'll, I'll be lucky enough that most of my ideas will find a place. There'll they'll be, they'll be a place for it that I can, that I can put it. So that's awesome. So you have the inspiration to uh, come up with that many ideas. That's, so, that's a very valuable computer you have. I think people <laughs> might want to take a – I hope you don't have any pirates on your computers uh, doing secret downloads. That you're not oh, aware no. of. <laughs> that's, that's gold. Or at least uh, I feel the ideas are probably gold. But it, it, that's not to discount the fact that your process of weeding out which is right for what project and how to flesh out those ideas in particular directions, the whole problem solving side of the creative process, that's not to be undersold either. Um, Fez, you keep talking about Fez, I keep talking about Fez. Everyone's wondering when is Holmes going to ask about Fez 2? Because I'm just going to ask about it. Uh, when did you when did you get started on Fez two? Did you start on it yet? Are we started? I don't I don't know if Are I don't we? know. I don't know if, I don't know if the creation the creation of a teaser counts as starting. I don't know if it, I don't know if that counts. I don't know if it counts. You are one of the only things that was announced about it though. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been following Phil Fish's Twitter. He was talking about said some interesting things about Zelda one. If, if Fez 1 is Zelda 1, then Fez 2 is going to be like Zelda 2, so don't expect just a rehash of the same engine, but it's in the same world. It's kind of a different view of the same world. Then he was talking about like underwater levels and um, uh, the music video for a Radiohead song, and I want to make like a game that's like that Radiohead music video, and I tried to joke with him about it, but uh, I didn't hear back from him because, as I know, Phil... His relationship with the video game press uh, hasn't been too hot lately. Uh, mm. So many of us have made him sad, and as a member of the video game press, I've apologized to him, just like you know, just like I've apologized for all men to certain women. I'm like, I'm sorry, we're terrible <laughs> sometimes. I've apologized to Phil Fish for the way his tweets have been taken and, and run with. But anyway, Fez Two, have you started working on it? Can you say either way? The first thing I did was the teaser. Uh, and I mean, we've, we've definitely been talking about it and, you know, working on planning and stuff. Uh, but it's pretty early, you know, mm -hmm. it's pretty early. We're pretty so, excited though. That's I think a, I can say that problem. without, without, uh, angering Phil. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, uh, yeah, he probably doesn't want me to say anything. So probably not. If I were him, I probably wouldn't want you to say anything, but I'm me. And me wants you to say a thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you well, you heard, it here, another... you heard it here first. Phil and I are working on Fest 2. It's, it's going to be good. Do you I'm think it'll be, be another... Phil's uh, doing music, and I'm doing... I'll, I'll, I'll be programming. So. 
<laughs> that would be pretty amazing. And I do want to ask about your ideas for games. I don't want to forget to do mm. that. But do you think it'll be another five years that you'll get to work on Fez 2? Because that would be awesome. You could just collect all the ideas. Five years. That that might be that might be uh, hmm. That might be cutting it too. That might be too safe. Five years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You think it might be longer than that? This time? I I don't. I have no idea. Yeah. To be, how could you be know? honest? I have no idea how long it will take. Yeah. Are you hoping for another five years so you'll have more time to just? It'd be nice. Down? It'd be mm. nice to have that much time to work on something. I mean, could it, it would have to be. I mean, if it wasn't really good, I would be, I would be lambasted. I'm sure for spending yeah. years on something. And well, all the same, even years. if it's only a year or so, uh, do you feel pressure to be working on the sequel for your most well-known project? Do you feel any pressure to maintain or even uh, 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 raise the bar higher so people continue to get the same feeling they did from Fez? I always find that sophomore efforts are are scarier than the initial, because the initial, you can take all the risks you want, and there's no expectation. Uh, but Fez 2, for Phil and for you, I'd imagine that there's a whole different psychology behind the crafting of that, where you have to take new factors into account. Uh, so has that changed the way you're thinking about it at all? I mean, I go out of my way to make every project different. Um, so, I mean, if I wanted to do Fez 1 Part 2, I could, and it would be pretty easy, I think, because I'm just so familiar with it. But I'd much rather do, I'd much rather challenge myself to do something new and exciting and and, um, and that's I think that's my plan. I mean I, I I don't see myself just you know loading up all just loading up the old Fez one you know patches or whatever and just changing the notes and shipping sure. it. So it's it's going to be different. Uh, I mean if you if you listen to the teaser, it's kind of different. It's not it's not like the same exact style as the first game. So like musically. Um, and I th I'm, that's sort of the aesthetic that I've kind of at least laid down as an initial idea. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of the general direction that I'm looking at. Well, I'll uh, I tell you. I mean, it's teaser music, so I don't know. I don't know if that – I don't really know where I'm going is what I'm trying to say. I don't know what that's I'm doing. Awesome. That's so good. I'm so <laughs> cause that, that means anything could happen. It's anything can happen. That, yeah, uh, when people follow a blueprint, you know where they're going as a as an audience, and it gets predictable. And you almost don't even like there's video games and music that I don't feel like I need to even buy because I've already played it in my head. Like I I know these guys. I know they're just following the blueprint at this point, uh, so I don't have to bother. But with you and with Phil, I feel like you guys are going in direction. That you're just kind of expressing who you are in that moment as you go along. Like Fez was a very different game when Phil started it, and then it was, it changed because he changed as a person by the end of it, and he said uh, many a time that Fez is like the best representation of who he is as a human being that he could come up with. Um, and that's what I love about it. And likewise, the music is a representation of you, and what I hope you both do is just give me who you are in the moment, and let me love it. Cause I probably and then you get to listen to my moment like a year or two years later when it's no longer relevant. <laughs> well, that, yeah, that must feel so weird for you. I wonder that about every uh, every person who puts out uh, music in particular because music is such like a, a personal thing where when you create it, you feel it very hard that year, and then yep. maybe five years later, you're like, I don't really even feel that way anymore. That's not even kind yeah. of who I am. But people still come up to you and want you to play that same song over and over again, I'd it's, imagine. It's strange. I mean, because music is such a... It's like a it's like a snapshot of that moment in your life, you know, everything that's going on, and then and then to not make that available until years later. It's like you're always you're always ahead of other people, or you're I don't want to say ahead, but you're you're somewhere else. Like mm. everyone else has a perception of you, mm -hmm. but that perception is kind of it's kind of you two or three years ago or whatever, and you're kind of somewhere else because you're always kind of. Trying to, you're always trying to expand and do new things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The ideas Which, you have now are different than the ideas that you were able to polish that you had six months ago. So the only stuff that people see is the stuff that you came up with a while back when you were a different dude. I wonder if they'll be able to make like an instant, <laughs> instantaneous music, just like like the the, the communication they use in um, uh, I think it's Adventure Time. They just have a crystal that goes in your brain. You shoot brainwaves out to other people 
uh, they can just do a mu musical brainwave thing. I'm babbling. I'm going to do the questions <laughs> before I make more of a butt of myself. Mironaplix2 asks, do you allow streamers to use your amazing music on their streams? As opposed to your regular music, I suppose. For the most part, yeah. Pretty much. Uh, if anyone's, you know, making lots of money, it would be nice to, you know, talk to them first. But for the most part, I just let, you know, if someone, you know, if someone's doing like a, vid a video on YouTube or they have like a, a podcast that's starting up or whatever, I'm usually pretty open to just letting people mm -hmm. have at it. I guess your options would be either sue them or to ask them to give you some money, or you can monetize now with YouTube, but that's mostly for just putting ads at the end of a video, like any video that uses your music. You could technically have an ad for Disaster Piece play at the end. That would be cool. I, I don't think I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's I think that... Taste. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's so obviously in poor taste. But the larger companies who have never even come close to wanting to stream a video, and uh, the guys working there have no uh, connection with that culture. Um, they figured nobody would care, but boy, did it make them look bad. Uh, Sparse Vector asks, The Sync Cave in Fez completely blew me away. The music and gameplay are so amazingly integrated. Is there a story behind this part of the game? Do you remember anything specifics around what that part was uh, supposed to be about, what you wanted people to feel through the creation of that aspect of the game? There was a there was a system in place before I started working on the project, so they so they knew that it was going to be a musical type level. Mm -hmm. So the system was the the platforms, you know, appearing and disappearing in time. Mm -hmm. um, so I just tapped into that system and made I made musical sound effects for the platforms. And then came up with a came up with a strategy for how the music would actually work, like the under the underlying music to go with the platforms. And basically, the way it works is that as you ascend this structure, the the different aspects of the music fade in gradually, and um, you know, and then you get to the, the then you get to the ending with has all these like crazy stairs, and each of those has like its own sound as well. So I just kind of um, that's kind of how it came together and trying to make the whole thing feel like a like a music even though it's like a this interactive experience um. there's more and more of that these days and I'm always kind of in shock that the sound um, the sound designers and the composers can integrate the sound effects so well into the music and give the player the opportunity to be like co-composer at that point because the player's actions trigger the sound effects which somehow fit in sync with the music, it's a. It seems like it would be an incredibly tough thing to weave together. But the way you talk about it, it sounds like oh, there's a system in place. Just did some sounds. Worked <laughs> out. <laughs> was that was that something that you took on, and did it feel more challenging than than other work, or did it just kind of come together? Uh, I would say, in almost all cases, or most cases, doing interactive things with music is harder than doing linear music. It, generally, it's it's harder because you're you're trying to you're trying to do something that's had a dimension to it. It's like if linear music is two dimensions, interactive music is three dimensions because it's like there's this unknown thing where anything can happen or a lot of things can happen. So you have to think about how that, you know, what kind of ramifications that has on how things sound. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of cases, it's harder. Um, there are certain situations, though, where it comes together really fast because you have this idea that's that's really clear, uh, this interactive idea, and the hardest part may be the programming part, you know, mm -hmm. where it's just f making it work technically. Um, mm -hmm. The part that I, the the the, asp, the the section of Fez that I like to talk about the most is uh, in the graveyard, because um, in the graveyard there's like uh, there's there's this music that's kind of it's supposed to be like a storm. It's like these big chords that are like boom, and then you hear like this like rain type like notes like that goes on for a while, <laughs> and the the amount of time between each time you hear that big boom with the rain is different. It's random, so every time you go through that level, it's a little bit different. Um, and the idea was like you know let's make the music like a rainstorm, like a thunderstorm, where you don't know when the next thunderstrike is going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and that I mean that idea came to me like 
it was just kind of like, oh, I have this great idea, and then I know how to I know how to do it. It's not from a musical standpoint, it's pretty straightforward. It was just like create, you know, create eight of these big booms with with rain that kind of you know r musical rain that happens. The hard part is actually you know coordinating with with a programmer and putting together the system that makes all that stuff go. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that they were. It sounds like they were supporting a lot of your ideas. You would come up with something uh, as opposed to the other way around. I'm sure it was a, a back and forth, but you would have a concept and they'd be like, we'll make that work in the game. Yeah, I mean, I, I have nothing but the highest praise and respect for Renault, who, who actually works at Cappy now. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he was fantastic to work with, and um, uh, he... Hold on, someone just came into my house and I'm distracted. I'm going to close my door. <laughs> um, yeah, he was he was really rad to work with. And uh, he was, you know, always open to ideas that I might have. Um, and we had a really good, you know, back and forth about that stuff. Like, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this? And he's like, we can do that. Let's do it. And then we would. That's awesome. That's it's true great. collaboration, which is something... I don't hear a lot about, sadly, for the for the developers and the composers. I'm hearing a lot of the power dynamic seems to be very top down most of the time. So, would you ever want to do a rhythm action game? You know, like a Parappa the Rapper. It would have to be the right kind of rhythm action game. Mm. Um, a lot of rhythm action games I'm not really interested in for some reason. I feel mm. like I should be, but I just I think I just have I I expect things from rhythm action games, like I to do a certain thing and a lot of times they fall short somehow. Um, hmm. it, would be a, it would be a great challenge, I think. I think it's hard. It's probably really hard to do good things with that. It would be a nice yeah, challenge. Yeah, I think that, that was a good way of putting it. A lot of people just put them out. It's a popular genre because it's, I guess, simple to follow the blueprint for them, but to do something really interesting with them yeah. Uh, might be a lot harder. Is there a specific thing you don't like about the genre? Is there a way that it kind of lets you down more often than not? Um, I don't think so. I don't think there's any specific thing. I just I, there haven't been a lot of rhythm action games that have like been like, wow, that's amazing. I wish I had you know, I wish I had come up with that idea or wish I had mm -hmm. made that. But I think there's there's so much potential there. You know, there's so much potential in that idea. Mm -hmm. um, that it's definitely intriguing to me, the possibility mm -hmm. space for that. So, sure. Yeah. Well, I hope someday that becomes a thing. You've got a lot of time ahead of you, so that might be, <laughs> that might be a time. I don't keep do saying that. yes to projects. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Twelve. Can't even imagine doing that. Um, let's see. What? This is from Angry Toad. He says, "What VST do you normally use? What DAW do you use?" Digital Tele Audio Workstation. Um, I use I use Logic Pro. Um, I, I got my I got my start in GarageBand. I wrote like f I wrote my first four or five albums in GarageBand, uh, and then I and then I worked in Reason for a couple years. Uh, I did this album called Rise of the Obsidian Interstellar, which is a like a chip tune prog rock album. That's that's a Reason album, and then every pretty much everything since then has been Logic Pro. Um, mm. I've kind of found my found my place. With that, I'm pretty comfortable with it. How about VSTs? Did you just describe those and I didn't notice? <laughs> not VS, sure. VSTs are uh, virtual instruments. Uh, ah. I use I use a lot of native instruments uh, software. Uh, they make they make a bunch of really good synthesizers. Uh, I use Massive and FM8, Absynth, Reactor, um, to name a few of the synths that I use. Mm -hmm. Do you ever want to compose for a full orchestra? You were talking about brass before. Would you ever yeah. want to just get up there in front of the guys with the trumpets and tell them what to do? I would love to write music for orchestra. Um, I would not love to orchestrate music for orchestra because it's really hard. Um, mm. So ideally, I would I would find you know I would find an orchestrator to help me uh, to do that work for me. But um, I'm definitely interested in writing for orchestra. Um, I've been thinking about doing some 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 small ensemble pieces like like string quartet or something like that. So that's definitely something that's been on my mind and mm. uh, maybe I'll hopefully I'll get around to it at some point. Yeah, I hope <laughs> so. Or you might get headhunted for it. Uh, I've heard rumors. I don't know him 
to ask him personally, though I sure would like to, that Austin Wintery, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, the composer for Journey, after he got that Grammy nod, um, film and TV guys are just after him. And he still were doing game work, but just as with Fez kind of changed your position in the industry, uh, Journey has changed his, and now people are, are wanting him to just do more profitable, definitely, from what I've been told anyway. Yeah, to bigger. Spielberg movie. Sure. Well, if Spielberg came to you and was like, movie, please, movie soundtrack, please, do it. Uh, here's the million. Would you be like, okay? Or would you be like, ah, I don't know how to do that, Spielberg. What how could I turn that? I mean, if he came to me, he would probably be coming to me with the, like, you know, knowing knowing my work and wanting mm. me to basically do what I do. Just so... I mean, that's I, how could I say no to that? I mean, that's that's amazing, you know. Yeah, I, I, I want you to be yourself. Here's a million dollars. It could then, happen. You know. Yeah, I, I <laughs> hope it does. John Williams was just uh, like a blues band piano player when he first started, from what I've heard, anyway. Really, <laughs> pretty corny music. Some funny corny, just like do 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 do, sort of ragtimey. Mm. Music stuff, and John Williams, uh, I mean, uh, Spielberg was like, you seem like a nice guy, Johnny. Here's all my movies. And that was that. That's probably <laughs> totally wrong, but that's how I remember it anyway. Uh, TB Ranch Maninov asks... Rachmaninoff. Rachmaninoff. That makes much more than Ranch Maninoff. Ranch, Ranch Maninoff. <laughs> <laughs> asks, will we be seeing another standalone album, i.e. not a soundtrack anytime soon? Yes, I mean, I... Uh, this is this is like the New Year's resolution every single year for the last two years, two or three years, is to do a do a standalone album, and uh, it's still something I really want to do. But it's it's I'm still, uh, you know, I'm s still dedicating most of my time to to game projects and to other projects. Um, I'm still sort of paying the bills. Uh, I'm, I mean, I've only been out of school for like four years, so my priorities are not quite. They're not quite where I want them to be just yet. You know, I, I would like my priorities to be purely creative. Um, mm -hmm. They're getting closer to that, which is awesome, but I'm still not quite there yet. Um, but when I do get there, you know, there'll be a lot less, hopefully, there'll be a lot less, uh, I'll feel less less of a necessity to just, like, you know, work like crazy. Sure. And I can sure. focus on one or two things, which would be nice. It would be really nice. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. 12 is a lot to mentally... I imagine it's like having dating like 12 people, and you're like, this is what this person needs and wants. This is the side of me that this person <laughs> likes, so I'm going to like put that hat on. And uh, Do you feel like you have to mentally jump in between a lot of different uh, frames of mind, or do you just kind of stick with who you are and how you solve problems and uh, let the game influence you in the directions you're supposed to go in? It's not as hard as it sounds because I'm not actually working on 12 games at this 12 projects at the same exact time. Mm -hmm. um, all the projects have different timelines. Um, they require me to, you know, I can, I can certain projects I can start later. Like there, like maybe like three quarters of those I don't even have to work on right now. Mm -hmm. um, I don't even need to work on for a couple months or until next year. So you know, it's a lot of management, just like uh, you know being able to be like, okay, uh, for the next month or two, I'm going to be focusing on this thing and then this thing and then this thing. Sure, sure, sure. So oh. you get to stagger it a bit. Yeah. Uh, mentally, that must make a big difference. How do you choose which project you are willing to work on? Like, have people come to you with a project where you're like, that seems cool, but it's just not a good fit for what I want to do or what I'm good at doing, so you've had to turn it down. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't sound like you turn down much, but I have to imagine that there's some no, stuff. No, I do. I mean, I, it, I do turn on a lot of stuff. Um, yeah, it's, you know, you, you kind of, your time is limited, so you have to kind of pick and choose your battles, and, mm. uh, there's so many, comp there's so many super talented composers who, who need work, so, you know, I really try to, you know, pass, pass it around when I can to mm. other people, um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, picking the projects I want to work on, I have sort of, like, a... I don't know. I have a way of sort of looking at projects and being like, is this what I want to do? I go in like aesthetically. Um, is it going to be, is it a good, is it going to be a good game or is it going to be a good project or is it kind of going to be a piece of crap? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is sure. it going to be successful? Mm -hmm. um, that's always, that's not a necessity, but it's, you know, it's nice. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but my my overarching factor is you know is it is it cool? Do I does it you know do I react to it? Do I respond to it? Does it do I feel like I can be inspired by it? That's the most important thing. For mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, geez, more questions happened while I wasn't Ooh, looking. Bart definitely. Bart we asks, how do you manage to get on Spotify? We can go over our usual time date. Oh wait, that was from Sinistar saying that we can go a little late. Oh yeah, I haven't even been keeping track of time. Normally we're almost done, but I think we could probably do ten more minutes if that's okay, okay. with you. Okay, yeah, sure. So how did you manage to get on Spotify? What's the process for that? I think they have a they have a direct process, but I went through uh, I went through a distributor. Uh, there's there's people like CD Baby who do Spotify distribution. Um, I'm actually with. Uh, these guys are Discover, who are in San Francisco, and they have a they they do this thing called Joypad Records, which is like a video game music record label. Um, mm. and they also do this site called Louder, which is it's like a it's like Bandcamp, it's like a Bandcamp sty style platform. Um, mm. So I'm with I'm with those guys, and they help me out with sending my music out to uh, Spotify and RDO, iTunes, all that good stuff. Yeah, it sounds like. A publisher, but a much shrunk music publisher, like not someone who holds all the cards. Um, do you find that that's something that's helpful to have any sort of publishing, publishing or management or uh, people doing the the work that's non-creative to get mm. the music out there? Um, I I like doing that work, um, but I there are certain things that are just make sense for me to offload. Um, mm -hmm. Like uh, the digital distribution stuff, um, definitely. Like getting my music out to s stores and stuff is much easier to do it through a third party. Um, mm -hmm. Also, merchandise. Like I have a I have a company that helps me, um, you know, helps me like send out CDs and T-shirts and stuff like that. So I don't have to go to the post office every, you know, all the time. <laughs> so, um, but other stuff, you know, like business type stuff, I don't mind doing that stuff. It doesn't. Uh, for me, it's 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 nice to get away from music. I find I, I like doing other things. Um, it helps keep me keep me fresh. I think. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. A lot of people do kind of hold themselves up and just think I have to make all the music because I've got to pay the bills and also because I want to win at this. I don't want to um, be unsuccessful and and squander opportunities. And as a result, they don't go outside or find out that no new energy comes in and no different type of problem solving happens mentally so they kind of get stuck as the same person and kind of stasis the same hole. So yeah. I'm glad you uh, are willing to jump around a little bit with what kind of problems do you solve. And before I forget, and we might run out of time, do you want to make video games of your own? Is, are those the kind of problems you want to solve in terms of actual game design? Um, well, I, I made this one thing. It's not really a game. It's it's a it's like a music tool in the in the shape of a game. It's called January, um, and you walk around. You're a little guy, and you walk around and you lick snowflakes. It's like a it's like a snowstorm. And there's I totally forgot you made that. I freaking love yeah. that game. I've said <laughs> cool. that to so many people who are like. Video games are fine, but it's just you have to learn how to do something, and then you're sad when you fail. I'm like, not in January, you don't. Just be, there. <laughs> just be in January. And uh, yeah, I can be. think of <laughs> it's such a wonderful little thing. I forgot that you made that. People should yeah. play that right away. Good game. Well, cool. it's yeah, it's at January.cc if you want to mm. check it out. Mm -hmm. I've made it a little bit more utilitarian. It used to be more like a like a, it used to be more artsy fartsy. You like there was a poem and you walked around. Now it's more like you know here's a tool that you can kind of do musical things with and export MIDI files and do all kinds of cool stuff. For real, I only yeah. played the poem version, which I thought was very nice. Yeah, but, this uh, one's this one's a bit more cut and dry. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to checking that out. Uh, would you ever want to do a game for sale, like uh, uh, make that kind of the second tier of, of what you do professionally? Yeah, I've definitely flirted with it. I have a bunch of ideas that um, I haven't really realized. Um, I started working on a game with some guys like last year, and we kind of took a hiatus and haven't really haven't really continued on with that. But it was a it was a rhythm type game. Oh, cool. Um, and it was coming along pretty nicely, but uh, there's so much stuff going on, and, and uh, I'm trying to 
trying to prioritize properly and figure out what's the most important thing for me right now. So um, we'll we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. And were you working on Were you working on Samurai Gun too? Did I hear that rumor properly that you had involvement with that in some way? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I I played a show at Indiecade while Samurai Gun was was uh, being displayed behind me. Um, and Bo Blythe is a friend of mine, uh, so there's that. But I there's no official uh, okay. affiliation with it. Um, that's a really be... cool game, though. <laughs> yeah, it's super good. I've been waiting for the. I've heard so many different things. I should email Bo to to just find out. But I always forget that I can talk to people. I just wonder what they're doing alone in my room. And I've wondered if that game is still coming to Xbox Live Indie Games, and if it's going to still have the single player component. I'd heard about. I guess I should oh, find I that out. Yeah. I have no oh. Idea. oh, okay. I, his other game is one of my favorites, Zero Space. I don't know if you've oh, played that Oh, yeah, game. absolutely. That game I've is been, super cool. I really want him to put that, Samurai Gun, and then there was a third one that was really good, but um, uh, my memory lapses are bad today. I wanted him to put all of those competitive... Um, Death Disc? Is it LA yeah. Death Disc? Yeah. Which he's still working on for the yeah. uh, LA Game LA Game Space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm hoping he puts all those together into a thing, because I think... He could become rich and famous. Um, <laughs> let's say Roth Sothy says, I remember you posting your tunes on 8BC a few years ago. Since that site is down for a while now, what other music communities besides SoundCloud Bandcamp do you go to now? Are and then he not? says, called it. <laughs> because I guess we talked about that already, kind of. Did we miss anything in there? Oh, no, that's uh, that's not. That's the other guy. That's, that's Conrad. <laughs> I guess, yeah. What uh, <laughs> um, music communities. Well, if you're interested in chip music, there's chipmusic.org, which is a, it's sort of the, uh, I don't want to say it's the, 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 the follow-up to APC, but it's it was the other big uh, chip tune community that's and happens to still exist. Um, and it's, yeah, I haven't really, I haven't really been frequenting music communities that much lately. Um, I probably should or could, but I've been so busy <laughs> just just mm-hmm. working on music lately that it's uh yeah. I well, I I find that with a lot of people once they get into a space professionally where it's like you have sixteen hours you're going to be awake today. What are you going to do? They like they stop playing video games. They stop uh, uh kind of doing online chats and you know that whole game of just. Uh, growing in your communications with other people, uh, and the the game they focus on is just like making a thing. Yeah. And, uh, they end up. It sounds like you're still doing stuff beyond that, but that becomes a huge priority, and other stuff that maybe seemed more important fades away as more opportunities hit. Yeah, I think just like you know, talking talking to people online, like in real time. And uh, forums, like those are the f- one of the first things to go, I think, for me, mm-hmm. just in terms of how can I better optimize my time, especially now that I'm working more and, you know, I have to be in front of the computer all this time. Um, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be in front of the computer all day. So I'm trying to limit my, you know, how, how much time I spend playing games and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that makes I, a lot I of still play a lot of games, but, you know, I try to, I try to manage that a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I don't play any time sucks. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's sad. The the older I get anyway, I have to like measure fun moments per minute. And if I play a game for like 10 minutes and I had five fun moments, I'm like, I can't play this game anymore. It's just I'm simply not learning enough and I'm not getting rewarded enough. So like, it's like you refuel with games like that. They like give you energy and put you in a good mood so you can get back to work. And if yeah. a game just if there's not enough fun moments per minute, it's just, it's got to go. Sad. Yeah, I mean, I try to give games at least like you know thirty minutes to an hour to kind of captivate me or not. And by then, you know, you can usually make some kind of determination about whether you know you're going to keep playing or if you've you know you've seen enough. You you get it. It's cool. Whatever. And then you mm-hmm. kind of move move along. Sure. That's plenty of time. That's very generous of you, actually. A whole hour. Jeez, I think the, the stats... Well, some games, yeah, I'm being generous. Not all games are like... <laughs> some games are like, <laughs> what, what is this? You know, 
like am I missing something? And you give your, you give it one second thought, and then that's that's pretty much it. So mm-hmm. absolutely. <laughs> and you're in the business of making people not stop playing it. And I definitely uh, some of the games you've played, I might have felt like I knew exactly what I was getting, and I didn't need to continue if it weren't for the fact that the music was intriguing me and, and making me think like, I don't know, I don't know if I quite know what this is yet. I have to look into it a little more deeply. Um, <laughs> those dynamic music changes you do definitely help with that. Um, we didn't talk about just what video games you like, I guess. Mm. I'm interested in that. Are there games you grew up on that you thought, this makes video game a good genre? And are there games recently that you've played that you've been impressed with other than Samurai Gun and uh, Bo's other games, which are great? Uh, growing up, I... Uh... I played sports games a lot. I played Tecmo Super Bowl on Nintendo. It's one of my all-time favorite games. Um, NHL 94, which is another one of my favorite games. Um, I got into other st- genres late. Like I, I got, I didn't get into RPGs until until I was like 11, 10 or 11, mm-hmm. uh, when I played Super Mario RPG, and then I was like, wow, this is cool. And then I went through a, an RPG phase, but uh, uh, lately, I guess. Um, Hmm. I still play NHL games because I'm 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 kind of a hockey nerd. That's like mm-hmm. the only sport I follow. Um, and uh, Kentucky Route Zero, like I mentioned, I played recently. It's pretty mm-hmm. pretty awesome. Journey, love Journey. Mm-hmm. Um, Hotline Miami is really really good. Um, Civ Five. I play a lot of Civ Five, or I did. Went through a phase with that. Um, so not, you know, over time, you know, less and less console games, it seems like. Mm-hmm. I seem to be moving more towards desktop games, PC games, board games. I'm getting into board games the last couple of years. A lot of people are. It's uh, yeah. it's kind of reawakening the social side of, of a gaming experience, it seems, uh, mm-hmm. where people don't want to be kind of closed off. They want to have it be something that's very open-ended, very mm-hmm. unpredictable, and something that's also a uh, shared social experience. Is that what drew you back into uh, to board games or tabletop games? Yeah, it's it's definitely the multiplayer aspect and this, you know, being away from screen and just interacting with your friends and um, yeah, it's definitely something that I didn't get a lot of growing up. I don't think mm-hmm. so. Sure. Um, yeah, now except for like Mario Kart with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Would you? What if they? What if Nintendo wanted you to make... This is something I just started uh, asking people. What if Nintendo wanted you to take on one of their franchises and do the music for it? Is there there one particular Nintendo franchise you'd want to do the soundtrack for? Wow. Ah, oh, that's a tough question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I mean, I could, see, I could see myself doing like a Zelda game or a Mario game or something. My first thought was Metroid. I could see you... Yeah, I don't think I would want to do a Metroid game, though. Huh, interesting. How come? Maybe because it's what you would expect, or I don't know why you'd expect it, but I don't, I don't know why, but I, I've never been big into Metroid, so... Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. I, I love the music for Metroid, um, but I've never been a big player of Metroid games. Huh, Interesting. Yeah, the, the reason I thought of that is Metroid is very much about being in a place and the music does so much to make those places feel organic and yeah. um, like it's something you can interact with, which is one of your strengths. But but Zelda too. Zelda is just kind of um, Metroid with a sword in a lot of different ways. Uh, <laughs> and we ask. Mario too. That would be fun. That'd be That's fun why I would do it. I think it would be fun. You know. Yeah. And it would yeah, be yeah. it'd be different. Mm-hmm. And like I told you, I'm I'm you know I try to do new thing things. So. Well, I'm glad for that. And yeah. uh, I'm glad you're willing to be on this weird show that I do, where I just kind of talk and hope oh, I say something on. that's not too terrible. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Just like you said, every week I just hope that I have some chemistry with the guests and some fun comes out of it. And I that's had a whole heck of a lot of fun talking to you. Yeah, likewise. But that's, really? the, that's the secret to life, though, is not knowing what you're doing. Really? That's the secret to life. Yeah, that's the meaning of life. <laughs> now we know. Don't know what, you, you don't know what you're doing, forward. you'll do a good job. Eventually. <laughs> that feels fantastic. I, <laughs> yeah, don't, uh, don't expect yourself to figure it out too soon, but just keep yourself uh, open to the possibilities and don't follow that dumb blueprint people keep following. Okay, I, 
<laughs> Guess we should wrap up. Where can people find your stuff on the internet? Disasterpeace.com, and that's uh, peace like this way, P E A C E dot com. And uh, I'm on Twitter, Disasterpeace on Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff. So mm-hmm. look me up, check out my music and stuff. Yeah, your albums. Uh, 36 are albums and counting, so there's plenty ah. for There might be something for everybody, hopefully, maybe. That's how much work you did. Jeez. Well,. I have an unfair advantage because every time I work on something, like as my job, uh, I can release it as a soundtrack. <laughs> so it's it's kind of like my list of credits as a store or something. Sure, but yeah. with solo projects in there too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's sad. So many people who make, like the guy who made the music for Homefront, he can't just sell that. That's also the guy who did the music for the BitTrip series, actually. Mm. Um, and he, you know, that's some of his favorite music, the Homefront music, but he's kind of close off to it now. So I'm glad you get to do that and share your things with the people. And I hope people do check it out. And I hope you go on tour, too. I'd love to see you <laughs> and Yamaoka playing. I guess you would yolk, open up for him at this point. Or maybe do, like, some sort of fusion thing. That'd be pretty rad. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm going to uh, just pretend that's happening. As for me, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I'm at Tron Knots, And the show is on iTunes. You can download the reruns of it. We're up to like almost 70 episodes, I think. Um, so that's a thing. Sub Holmes on iTunes. And you can watch the reruns on Detroit TV on YouTube. And I also did a cartoon called Teenage Pokemon. A new episode just came out today on Machinima. And some people think it's the worst thing they've ever seen, and that I am an idiot and they hope I die. But other people are like, oh, this is pretty Check it out. (laughs) That's right. Thanks so much, Rich. Really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure, man. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya.